Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Strassheim, and uh, my colleague Kim Eilerts and I are very pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today about current issues in M&A law and practice. Okay, so there's just some brief information about Kim and me. Um, if uh, you want to follow up with us, with us with any questions after the presentation, that would be fine, in addition to uh, during the presentation. Okay, so the agenda for today is um, we're going to talk about uh, three discrete topics of interest to attorneys doing M&A work in the current environment. Um, first, I am going to talk about practical considerations in drafting and negotiating earnout provisions. Uh, as you'll see, earnouts can create a host of issues uh, that lend themselves to post-closing disputes, so it's uh, very important that you uh, if you do have an earnout provision in your deal, that you're very careful about thinking through all the issues. Um, next, I'm going to hand the baton to Kim, and she's going to talk about successor liability and asset transactions. And I think you'll find, uh, listening to her talk, that uh, even in asset deals, the you know the traditional rule that people go by is that you only assume the liabilities that you want to assume that's not always the case, and Kim will provide a lot more uh, useful information about that. Then finally, um, I'm going to talk about protecting privileged communications after a deal, particularly in the, concept, in the context of a merger transaction. And as you'll see, there was a, a Delaware uh, case that was issued um, a year ago, November 2013, that changed the relevant landscape somewhat and made this a potential trap for the unwary. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with the first topic, which is uh, practical considerations in drafting and negotiating earnout provisions. So it's always good to start with the basics. So what is an earnout? Uh, an earnout is a risk allocation mechanism used in M&A transactions uh, in which a portion of the purchase price is calculated and paid by reference to the performance of the acquired business over a specified period of time after the closing. So to, use a, to give a very simple example, you could have a, an upfront purchase price of $100 million in a deal, and then you could have the potential for the seller to earn uh, perhaps $20 million additional dollars over time based on the performance of the business. And performance can be measured. There's really no limit to the ways that performance can be measured. It's just whatever works for the deal. But common metrics include things like revenue, net income, or EBITDA. But in some deals, uh, especially when you're dealing with startup ventures where uh, revenues may be negligible and income you know, potentially even negative, uh, sometimes you'll look at growth of the business measured by new customers, things like that. So it can be done many, many different ways. Okay, if you haven't done an M&A transaction with an earnout before, you might be wondering why people would use an earnout. Um, there are actually several different reasons. The most common example is to close a valuation gap um, where the buyer thinks that the business is worth less than the seller thinks it's worth. Um, an earnout is a way that, that you can get the deal done by bridging the gap. Um, and a valuation gap can occur in lots of different deals, but a couple of classic examples might be a depressed business where the seller thinks that you know better times are just around the corner and the buyer's skeptical. Uh, could be a business that has very limited history. Could be a business that's introducing a new product and it's not clear how successful the product will be. Will be. So it really is kind of a show me the money type of situation. Um, but there are other reasons to use an earnout as well. Um, another reason to use an earnout is if the buyer has limited access to funds or if the buyer perhaps has access but just doesn't want to use external financing uh, to finance a deal. Um, I actually just worked on a deal that closed a couple of months ago uh, that where this, this exact purpose was, was, um, was what was motivating the structure of the deal. Uh, the, the buyer had originally intended to finance the deal using bank financing. For a variety of reasons, the buyer didn't want to do that, and so we ended up structuring a deal where the upfront purchase price was relatively low, uh, but then the seller would be paid, in this case, over a period of five years based on the performance of the business. So essentially the buyer was financing the purchase of the business by the uh, revenue that was generated by the business post-closing. And then um, uh, 
another reason why you could use an earnout would be incentive-based compensation, and that's particularly the case when you've got a seller who is staying with the business. Uh, so, you know, you hand somebody $100 million for their business and you're paying them $300,000 a year, maybe they're not that motivated to work hard. Uh, but if they have a stake in the business going forward, uh, in the sense that they can, if the business performs well, they can continue to generate income, that, that can be highly motivating. Um, so so those, those are some of the reasons. So just taking a step back and just looking at a high level at the advantages of uh, an earnout from the seller's perspective, as I mentioned, provides an opportunity for a higher price. And, and also, and this is a reason it's a little overlooked sometimes, but it can, uh, sometimes the seller is confident that once the business is integrated with the buyer's, you know, potentially larger business, that there will be synergies that will help the business going forward. So it may give the seller an opportunity to, to, to participate in the economic fruits of those synergies. From the buyer perspective, obviously, one advantage is that it allows the buyer to value the company more accurately uh, because you're, you're only paying uh, the higher price if the, if the business performs. Obviously, another reason is the, the time value of money aspect of being able to defer part of the payment of the purchase price. Um, you can use it to apportion risk, meaning, again, the buyer only pays if, if the business performs. As I mentioned, you can use it to motivate the sellers to stay on. Um, also, sometimes in an auction context where the buyer uh, knows that it's facing competition but doesn't want to overbid, uh, the buyer can suggest an earnout structure as a way to, to raise the, the price. Um, on the other hand, however, there are tons of disadvantages with earnouts, and and I have to say, from the I, while I recognize the need for earnouts in lots of transactions, I think they should be used very carefully. And frankly, I always get a little nervous when I see a, a letter of intent with an earnout because I know of the risks. Um, as those of you who work on M&A transactions know, lawyers spend a lot of time arguing over things like liability limitations, baskets, caps things like that, whether reps and warranties are qualified by materiality, knowledge, et cetera. In my experience, those types of issues have only rarely had significant impact after the deal closes. Um, for example, I've worked on uh, literally dozens and dozens of deals, and I very, very rarely have ever seen a buyer's remedy for an actual indemnity claim limited by the cap that was negotiated. Uh, by contrast, I have seen disputes in two areas. Uh, one is uh, post-closing purchase price adjustments, for example, based on working capital, which is a topic for another day, but the other is earnout provisions. And I think what these things have in common is that they're money issues. They directly affect uh, how much each party is either paying or getting in the deal. Um, you'll see at the top, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Airborne Health decision. It's a Delaware decision uh, shortly, but I think uh, Delaware Vice Chancellor Laster, who issued that opinion, um, really summed it up well when he said, an earnout often converts today's disagreement over price into, into tomorrow's litigation over outcome. The idea being, yes, it's helpful as a way to bridge the valuation gap to get the deal done, but oftentimes it can create a lot of potential for post-closing disputes. Um, so the real challenge is that you have to negotiate so many what ifs when when you're negotiating or not provisions because you just don't know what the future will bring, and trying to anticipate everything that could occur can be very difficult. Um, also, um, another uh, disadvantage is, and this can be a disadvantage from both parties' perspective, but the seller has to remain entangled with the business. Maybe the seller wants to go lie on the beach in Florida, and they can't do that. Um, Secondly, the buyer uh, may have its control of the business uh, somewhat uh, constrained in ways that the buyer is not comfortable with, so it prevents a clean break. Um, then also one, one uh, final aspect that I'll just mention quickly because it's overlooked a lot is it can have adverse tax and accounting treatments or it, it can have uh, tax or accounting treatment that's not anticipated, at least is maybe the better way to say it. Um, there is a, uh, an accounting rule, FAS 141R, that's been effective since 2009 that requires the buyer to record potential earnout payments at fair value on the date of acquisition and then to remeasure them periodically, which can lead to a great deal of earnings volatility. 
the old rule was that you only recognized um, the earn out payments at the time that they were earned. Um, secondly, um, with respect to tax, uh, and I've seen this in a recent deal as well, um, sometimes people overlook the fact that if, if the earn out is, uh, if the seller remains with the business, there is some potential for the earn out to be deemed to be ordinary income as opposed to capital gains, which as I'm sure everybody on this uh, webinar knows, or ordinary income is, is taxed at a higher rate than uh, long-term capital gains. So uh, sometimes sellers may not realize that they're going to get a different tax treatment than they had anticipated. Okay, so I'll, I'll run through this very quickly, but um, th th there's some just key drafting considerations to keep in mind. Um, the, the first is defining the scope of the business whose performance is being measured. That is relatively easy if it's a stock deal and the acquired business is doing something different than what the buyer historically has done. You can look at it as a standalone business. Can even uh, sometimes not be that challenging if it's if it's an asset deal, but it's really a different business than what the buyer historically has done, and the buyer perhaps uses a newly created entity to do the acquisition. But it's a lot more challenging if the buyer is already in the business and in disentangling sort of what is attributable to the buy, to the business that was acquired from what the buyer already had can be very challenging, and that that is an area that leads to a lot of post closing disputes. Um, establishment of the earnout period, um, you know, people will differ depending on the specific facts, but usually a buyer prefers a relatively short earnout period. Sellers sometimes prefer a long earnout period if it gives them more time to to earn the earnout. Um, structuring the earnout payments, uh, they can be structured as either, you know, sort of a binary, either you get the earnout or you don't. If you meet a certain target, it can be based on a percentage of income or EBITDA so that you can always get some payment as long as you're generating positive income. Uh, sometimes there's a cap. Other issues to consider are whether you can carry forward or backward performance. So let's say the first year, it's a two-year earnout. The first year is very bad, but the second year is gangbusters. And so on an overall basis, uh, the business has performed exceedingly well. Does the seller get to carry back that performance from year two and get credit for year one? Issues like that. Um, the next bullet point is going to be the heart of the rest of my talk on this topic, but it's covenants and other provisions regarding the post-closing operation of the acquired business. Um, so we'll defer that until just a minute. Um, acceleration rights. If, if I represent a buyer in an earnout, I always like to have the buyer just to have the option to just pay the earnout up front. Uh, well, not up front, but at, at the point when it wants it to end so that it doesn't have to deal with the covenants anymore. On the flip side, the seller may want acceleration rights if, say, the buyer sells its business or there's a change of control or something like that. They just may want the right to, to get the earnout at that point. Um, the next thing, again, an issue that's a little bit overlooked is, is it's usually helpful to put in a, a provision about how damages will be calculated in the event of a breach. And the issue here is that courts have a lot of difficulty. Let's say the buyer breaches its covenants with respect to the operation of the business. Courts have a lot of difficulty figuring out what the damages would be had the breach not occurred. So it's often a good idea to include a liquidated damages provision. And then uh, finally, dispute resolution. Um, generally, because these are usually based on financial metrics, it's usually advisable to have an accounting firm as the uh, arbiter. Uh, and you sometimes need to be careful about your um, provisions, otherwise dealing with uh, resolution of disputes that, that to make it clear that they don't apply to, to earn out disputes. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, the post-closing operation of the business is really what leads to a lot of the disputes. Um, to put it very simply, uh, the seller typically wants a lot of restrictions that set limits on how the business can be operated to prevent the buyer from gaming the earn-out process. The buyer, on the other hand, typically wants the, oper the ability to operate the business as it sees, sees fit with no restrictions whatsoever. And so oftentimes it's a it's a function of uh, each party's bargaining power, or maybe to some extent each, the sophistication of each party's counsel, but as, as to where you end up on these things. So just quickly to talk about some operational restrictions typically requested by the seller. Um, so the seller oftentimes wants just comfort that the buyer is not going to, to make dramatic changes. So 
to use an obvious example, let's not discontinue products or services. Um, want to make sure that the buyer supports the business financially. Um, want to make sure that the buyer, again, this is part of the whole gaming the system issue, but that the buyer isn't shifting sales of the acquired business to other units or shifting costs. Oftentimes uh, sellers are very concerned that the buyers will allocate excessive overhead from the parent company to the to business in an effort to artificially reduce earnings. Um, I mentioned before one of the challenges is defining the business um, whose performance is being measured. So the seller will typically want the buyer to maintain separate books and records for the acquired business and uh, often the seller will want to have access to those books and records. Um, the seller will want the buyer to act in good faith, and we're going to talk about a case in just a minute that specifically goes to that topic. Um, the seller may want the buyer to use its best efforts to achieve the maximum earnout. To be honest, I've never seen a seller successfully get that in there, but usually there will be some standard that the buyer has to meet. And then sometimes, especially if the seller is involved in the business going forward, it's going to want to veto right on major decisions such as hiring and firing key personnel. As I mentioned, really the, the buyer wants the obvious, which is basically the buyer wants to just do what it wants to do and not be subject to restrictions. Um, if you represent the buyer, it's a good idea to basically say that with the exception of any, of any expressly negotiated covenants, you have no obligations uh, to maximize the earnout that you can uh, conduct the business as you see fit. And then, uh, as I mentioned, an express disclaimer of that is, is usually helpful. So I'm just going to run through a few cases very quickly to, that have dealt with this issue. Um, uh, and I want to focus particularly on attempts by the seller to argue that the buyer had an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing to maximize the earnout, or at least not to take steps to minimize the, the earnout. So this is, uh, if you read the earnout literature, this is one of the most commonly cited cases, the O'Toole case. Um, it's a Tenth Circuit case applying Delaware law. Um, so uh, basically, in this case, you had a buyer that did a lot of things that just didn't smell very good. For example, it changed product names. It required the acquired business to prioritize sales of products not subject to the earnout. It discontinued certain products and shut down manufacturing facilities, and it forced the acquired business to bear the design and production costs of another line of the buyer's businesses. And so the court found that although there was no, there were no covenants that expressly prohibited what the buyer was doing, the court found that conduct that frustrates the entire possibility of the seller's earnout is a, is a breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. As I mentioned, uh, it didn't pass the smell test what the buyer was doing, and so a significant factor was that the buyer had admitted that it acquired the, the target in part to remove a competitor from the market, and there was evidence of an ulterior motive in the conduct of the buyer was enough, I'm sorry, the evidence of ulterior motive in the conduct of the buyer was enough to allow an inference of bad faith. Um, so, so the, this goes to the, the point that there's an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing basically in every contract that, uh, unless it's expressly disclaimed, that protects the spirit of the agreement. Um, however, the, the helpful thing, I guess, if you're representing a buyer is that um, the O'Toole case is, is a bit unusual and similar arguments have usually not prevailed in other cases. Um, the Airborne Health case, and this is the one where I quoted the Vice Chancellor Laster speaking about uh, converting a disagreement over price into post-closing litigation. Um, in this case, you had uh, the purchase of a brand name, goodwill, and intellectual property for a purchase price of $1 million and a potential earnout of $26.5 million. So if you've done deals with earnouts, you know that this is a little bit unusual because usually the earnout is a fraction of the upfront purchase price as opposed to the opposite. So in this case, the real value of the deal was in the, um, was in the earnout. Um, the, uh, but in this case, uh, there were some facts that, that suggested that the parties had really thought through some of the things that could happen post-closing. Um, shortly after the acquisition, the buyer suffered crippling litigation and negative publicity with regard to an unrelated product, and the earnout targets were not achieved. Um, Importantly, however, the acquisition agreement had a provision requiring the buyer to return the sold assets if certain business targets, such as advertising, spending, and sales, were not achieved. So when the seller came in and alleged that the buyer breached the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing by not spending enough money to market the squid soap product, 
um, the, the the court basically said, look, it's that you can't use the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing to redo a deal you guys thought through, and the remedy was that you could get the assets back, but we're not going to impose a, a greater responsibility. And in this case, uh, there was no evidence that the buyer was was acting with some bad ulterior motive. Um, the Winshaw versus Viacom case, um, it, this is uh, a case that's involved um, Viacom um, purchasing Harmonix Music Systems, which is if the developer of Guitar Hero and Rock Band video games. Um, and the case here was that the selling shareholders claim that the buyer had violated the implied um, covenant good, of good faith and fair dealing by not negotiate, renegotiating certain distribution fees. And basically their, their view was that if they had been more proactive in trying to renegotiate these fees, that the, the earnout would have been achieved. Um, the court rejected those arguments and basically said that in, in the absence of a specific covenant requiring the buyer to maximize the earnout, that it was not going to impose that. Okay, so just um, a couple sort of concluding things to keep in mind. Um, some lessons to, to keep in mind. Um, my general sense is that the Delaware courts are not eager to subject a buyer to an implied covenant of good faith to change the deal as negotiated by the parties. This is particularly the case where there's no obvious bad motive. However, there are some other jurisdictions that may be more open to these types of arguments. Uh, for example, there's a recent First Circuit case interpreting Massachusetts law. It's called Sonoran Systems Inc. versus Perkin Elmer that held that a buyer must use reasonable efforts to promote the acquired business. So given that the courts are not consistent, um, I think the, the main lesson here is that you've got to uh, really consider in a very serious way and think through what appropriate covenants are uh, for the operation of the business going forward and then make sure, especially if you represent the buyer, that you expressly disclaim any other covenants as part of the deal. So. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim to talk about successor liability. Great. Thanks, Fred. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I begin my presentation on just a couple of housekeeping items, um, I do want to remind everyone that you can leave the webinar, and you do that by logging out, uh, and you can return by logging in again. Uh, you, you can also uh, post questions to the webinar, and Fred and I will try to answer them during the presentation um, or at the end. Uh, my topic today is uh, successor liability in asset transactions, and I chose this topic because I think it's become increasing, increasingly important for practitioners. Um, there have been some interesting uh, recent developments in case law for this topic. So let's start with a few basics. Um, when one company buys the business of another, this acquisition can take many different forms. Uh, but there are two basic forms for uh, an asset or for an acquisition. Uh, the first one is a stock sale, and what, that is when the purchaser of a business buys the stock or ownership of that company. And when that happens, basically the buyer uh, acquires all of the company's assets, all of the rights, all of the liabilities, the whole business. The second way uh, to structure these transactions typically is uh, an asset sale. And in that circumstance, the purchaser selectively chooses the assets that will be acquired and the liabilities that will be assumed. And so uh, this uh, structuring a transaction as a purchase of assets um, rather than stock is a common way for purchasers to limit their exposure to the liabilities of a seller. Uh, case law and statutes have expanded successor liability beyond traditional common law doctrines, and courts have found um, increasingly that buyers in asset purchases will be liable for the seller's liabilities, uh, even where general common law exceptions don't apply. In this presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, review some recent case law in the labor and employment context, expanding federal successor liability. And then also I'm going to go through a few selected other areas where the successor liability for uh, asset purchasers has been expanded by either statute or case law. And then we're going to talk about some ways to uh, reduce risk in these transactions. So going back over, uh, there are some common law exceptions. So the basic rule is that in an asset purchase transaction, a purchaser of assets only takes the liabilities of the seller 
um, and will not be liable for other liabilities of the seller if, unless one of four exceptions applies. So the first one is where the buyer expressly assumes or agrees to assume the seller's liability. So for practitioners, you typically see um, in asset purchase transactions, you'll see a list of the liabilities that the buyer will assume, and then you'll see typically a disclaimer that the buyer will not assume any other liabilities of the seller, and that's generally respected. There are a few other places cases or examples where courts have found that a buyer of assets will be liable uh, for the liabilities of the seller. Um, one traditional exception is what's called a de facto merger. And in a de facto merger, uh, the purchaser uh, is it's akin to a merger even though it is an asset sale. And the courts uh, view, they see sort of a commonality of owners, so the same shareholders and also continuity of enterprise, meaning the same management, the same personnel, locations, operations. The, the third uh, exception is called uh, mere continuation of the seller. And it's very similar to a de facto merger, but essentially it's where um, the operator of a business uh, forms a new entity, sells the assets to that new entity, and shuts down the old. And it's uh, aimed at stopping owners who dissolve one company to begin another and escape liability in that respect. So, And then the fourth um, traditional common law exception is uh, fraudulent transfer. So if there is fraudulent intent, um, courts will find that a buyer in an asset transaction is liable for the um, liabilities of the seller. So um, there have however, been recent expansions in case law uh, that expand successor liability beyond those four traditional uh, exceptions that we just talked about. Um, more recent developments uh, have expanded federal successor liability in the employment law context, and so we'll go through that in some uh, new cases. So federal successor liability, this, this doctrine, um, basically I, I, I posted here a, a quote from a recent case in 2013 called Teed versus Thomas and Betts. And uh, it sort of sums up what federal successor liability is. It says when liability is based on a violation of a federal statute relating to labor relations or employment, a federal common law standard of successor liability is applied that is more favorable to plaintiffs than most state law standards to which the court might otherwise look. So what this means is there's, a, there's sort of a rationale for successor liability. Uh, there's some sort of overriding federal policy like a uh, federal employment statute for the protection of workers or to foster labor re relations. And so the courts see this as an important federal policy, and therefore they will uh, hold buyers and asset sales liable for the liabilities of the seller, even where uh, you know, they're two completely unrelated entities. So some of the factors, let's look at the factors. Now courts are all over the place on what they actually look at, but there's some patterns and these are some nine factors that are often reviewed um, in determining that there is successor liability. One is uh, courts view that buyer had prior notice of the charge, the labor charge, the pending labor lawsuit, or the employment liability. Uh, that uh, is a factor favorable to successor liability. The second one is the ability of the seller to provide relief, and that's normally one that's very easily satisfied. And then the other uh, factors are where there has been substantial continuity of business operations. What that means is a court will look at whether the buyer uses the same facilities, the same workforce, the same working conditions, the same equipment, products. You don't have to have all of those factors, but um, you know several of those factors are important. Um, the key point is that this is a lower standard than the common law de facto merger and continuation that we just talked about because they can be completely unrelated entities. So if you look at these factors, you're probably saying to yourself, ah, the first one says the buyer had prior notice of the liability. So that seems to promote a buyer from, to, it seems to incentivize them not to do due diligence, to not get, do not have notice of um, a particular liability, but the case law shows that um, this key factor that the buyer at prior notice is very easy to establish. Uh, notice has been found in cases where there is uh, implied knowledge. So I gave some examples here. Uh, one is Golden State. That's a Missouri, or sorry, that's a U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, 
And in that situation, there were some negotiations between a buyer and a seller um, by one person who was a manager of the seller, and then he became the manager of the buyer. And the court found that that supported an inference that the buyer knew about an unfair labor practice. Um, the second one there, um, the knowledge of an unfair labor practice was inferred where uh, sellers and buyers, uh, the, the seller and the buyer had operations and they were physically close to each other and there had been a lot of press recently about a labor dispute. And so the court uh, found inferred knowledge. And then I, you know, I gave another one where there was a, basically a phone call. Uh, so there, as you can see, this supports the inference, uh, you know, there's, that there's implied knowledge, and so that um, key factor is easily satisfied. Okay, turning to Teed versus Thomas and Betts. Um, this is a 2013 case that expanded federal successor liability in the context of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA. Uh, there's been a, a pattern of cases that have continued to expand this federal successor liability in various other areas, and we'll go over some more. But this is the recent case I wanted to focus on, and let me give you some facts. So there was a company called J.T. Packard, and J.T. Packard uh, was in the equipment uh, maintenance business, and it had a parent company. Well, J.T. Packard was sued by its employees for overtime pay violations, and the employees actually won a judgment of about a half a million dollars. Um, completely unrelated, the parent company defaulted on a loan, and uh, it was a $60 million loan, and the, the parent had actually pledged the stock of J.T. Packard. So the bank foreclosed, and it sold the assets of J.T. Packard in a foreclosure auction. There was a buyer named Thomas and Betts, and that company knew about the liability. And in fact, that asset sale transaction where they bought J.T. Packard's assets expressly disclaimed all those liabilities and named that specific labor claim. Uh, the court did not care. In that circumstance, even though there were two unrelated parties, the court imposed successor liability, and the rationale was to foster labor relations. Again, the key concept is the FLSA is protective of workers. It's an important federal policy, and we see need for six federal successor liability. Um, the, the court in that case actually did not go through all of the nine factors in detail. Um, they gave you a little chilling quote at the bottom, and I've put that in the slide. It says, successor liability is appropriate to enforce labor employment laws unless there are good reasons to withhold liability. So um, a few, some more cases. As I said, there's sort of a line of cases, and um, I've given you some examples. Uh, ERISA violations, there's a couple of cases there where federal successor liability has been found for uh, a seller's delinquent ERISA fund contributions. Uh, the uh, NLRA uh, in Golden State, the U.S. Supreme Court found successor liability for an unlawful discharge claim. And then um, the third case down there, uh, federal successor liability for employment discrimination. A couple more, Title VII, uh, this has also been the case. Um, federal successor liability is found for uh, race and sex discrimination claims under Title VII. And for the FMLA, the Federal, uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act, there's actually a statute on this point uh, where a buyer in an asset sale can be held obligated for a seller's liabilities, and the statute considers eight factors in making that analysis, and they're sort of the same eight factors that are considered in the case law. Um, another one is collective bar bargaining agreements. I wanted to note that collective bargaining agreements sort of have uh, some special rules that apply to them. The, the cases are consistent with these other uh, employment law cases, but they are a little more complicated. I just want to note that. And uh, this is an, an exhaustive list, so there are other cases that cover these issues. So what does that mean for uh, practitioners in an asset sale? Really what that means is you really need to, to do uh, the type of due diligence that you would normally do in a stock sale, in an asset sale transaction where there, you know, there are uh, employees involved, labor and employment violations. And the reason is, is, as I said, inferred knowledge is a very low standard, and so that means, um, you know, really digging in, reviewing liabilities, prior liabilities, litigation searches, um, those kinds of things. And this, the second way to handle it, as 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 we know, is you also need to think about uh, getting robust representations in your purchase agreements. Uh, 
um, lengthening indemnity survival and escrow. Uh, you know, practitioners often uh, negotiate very heavily how long do the reps and warranties survive in an asset deal. And so this, these cases show that there, you should, you know, consider having longer survival periods for your reps and warranties relating to labor and employment violations. Um, and then, and then uh, larger escrows. Um, Uh, so I, when I was researching this topic, I became interested in reviewing some of the other areas of the law that where successor liability can be found in asset transactions. And so um, very quickly, I want to keep on track, but I want to go through just a few other areas where there can be successor liability in asset transactions. Um, one is uh, tax. Tax is a big area. So there are state laws that... Um, uh, many states have laws that assess liability on buyers and asset transactions. And that, that, so that can be a buyer in an asset deal can be liable for a seller's sales and use tax, state unemployment, uh, state income tax withholding, and state income taxes. And so those states, uh, they provide a notice procedure, a bulk sale notice procedure, where the buyer or the seller tells the state that a sale is going to happen, and then you meet certain statutory requirements, such as a, a waiting period or a, um, a tax clearance certificate or something like that. This is not to be confused with the UCC's bulk sales uh, notice procedure. That's something completely different. Uh, I gave you two uh, statutory examples. Uh, Missouri, you know, there's a, there is a um, tax clearance process where the seller uh, of substantially all business assets requests a tax clearance, and then the buyer will not be held liable for those taxes if the tax clearance certificate is clean. And then there's a similar process in Illinois that actually has the buyer notifying the state. But Illinois is very interesting because you, you can actually be, be a buyer can actually be liable for a seller's income tax, state income tax, which is um, you know different than a lot of states. Um, in under the federal federal tax um, successor liability. Uh, Generally, there isn't a successor liability in an asset deal unless there's some sort of fraudulent intent. So practice tips. Um, really, this promotes, you know, going, looking at each tax, state's tax clearance process and going through that process before engaging in an asset sale. Now, I know that many of us, um, if you, you know, if you practice this, it's not always practical. The state process can be very long, sometimes up to 90 days. Sometimes the uh, notice occurs after the sale, um, so you have to think about holding some money in escrow as a buyer. Uh, so sometimes it's not actually practical to wait through the tax clearance process, but uh, it's just sort of those buyer beware, you can be held liable. Um, one, uh, a couple of other areas very quickly, uh, there is a, a small minority of states, maybe a handful, five or six. Uh, apply what's called a product line exception or a continuity of enterprise exception. And this is where an asset, in an asset sale, a buyer buys a, a product line, like a, manu, a manufacturer's product line, and continues to manufacture and sell that product after closing. And in that circumstance, courts have found successor liability, and the thought is people that are injured by products need to be protected, and if you're going to have the benefit of that product line, you should... Um, you should um, be liable for those. Um. The last one, um, uh, environmental, is, of course, far too broad to even touch upon um, in the time that we have. I did want to put it in there because, you know, there is uh, situations where property owners, um, you know, can succeed effectively to the liabilities of a, of a seller of that property simply because of contamination, and I won't go over all of that. But I did want to note that um, this actually, in environmental laws, the, the courts actually for a period of time until the early 90s actually applied the federal um, uh, successor liability doctrine, the one that we just talked about in environmental law. And uh, thankfully, um, in, uh, there's a Supreme Court case in uh, subsequent cases that um, they reject that now. So that is um, all. I will hand the presentation back over to Fred. Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, again, if anyone wants to ask questions as we're talking, feel free um, by using the, uh, the the box there. Um, but uh, so we'll go ahead now and just uh, uh, turn to our final topic of the webinar. And um, 
this is protecting privileged communications after a deal. And this I've, I found to be a very interesting topic because there was a court decision, I think I mentioned at the outset of the webinar when I was going through the agenda, uh, that was issued in, in November of 2013 that really threw a monkey wrench into this and has created a lot of uncertainty um, and, and frankly uh, created a, a playing field which is can be very challenging for the seller uh, in certain types of transactions in the event of a post-closing dispute. And it really is, as you'll see, sort of a metaphysical question of uh, really when the seller's counsel is, represents them, who do they represent? Uh, as uh, most of you probably know, and Kim went through a, a brief summary of the differences between an asset deal and a stock deal, but but basically, if if it's an asset deal, the seller is the uh, the company, and so the, the the company is usually, and when I say the company, it's the the selling company that's selling its assets. That that is the the client, so to speak. In a uh, in a stock deal where uh, the selling shareholders are basically selling all of the uh, of the outstanding capital stock of the target, then really the selling shareholders are are the client. And a lot of times when we do uh, engagement letters, uh, we don't we're not always careful to make that distinction, especially if we've been representing the uh, the target for years and years. They tell us that the business is being sold. And we just set up a file, and it's in the name of the selling entity, even if potentially it's a stock deal. Um, so, uh, and, and frankly, sometimes, uh, as uh, most M&A practitioners know, the, the deal, deal form will morph over time. I'm, I'm working on a deal right now that started as a stock deal and became an asset deal. So all those things create challenges. And in particular, in the concept of a merger, where you have one entity merging into another, um, the, the business of really who is the client and issues of attorney-client privilege can be can be very very significant. So, uh, as I indicate here in the first bullet point, the courts have reached different conclusions in deciding who owns pre-deal attorney-client privilege after a corporate transaction. And I think that M&A counsel should be aware of these issues because there are some opportunities to plan around them. Uh, knowing what the adverse result can be if you if you don't do appropriate planning and if you don't uh, try to address the issue contractually. Okay, so let's talk about kind of the, the general framework before the Great Hill case, which I'm going to talk about sort of dropped a, a, a bomb on, in this area. Um, the leading case uh, dates back almost 20 years, um, and it was a, a case that was decided by a New York court, Technicplex, Inc. versus Miner and, and Landis. Um, so in this deal, uh, Techniplex and uh, that, that was the target company, and then the sole shareholder was an individual named Tom Y.C. Tang. Um, and they were both parties to a merger agreement with an acquisition vehicle um, called TP Acquisition Company. Um, Techniplex merged into TP Acquisition with TP Acquisition as the surviving corporation, and then TP Acquisition became a subsidiary of, of the actual buying entity. Um, then TP Acquisition, as is common in these types of deals, changed its name to Techniplex Inc., so it took the name of the, of the former target. Um, so about a year later then, uh, new Techniplex, which is uh, this, this entity that I just described that it was formerly TP Acquisition, commenced an arbitration against Mr. Tang, the sole shareholder, alleging breach of the merger agreement. It specifically had to do with some environmental reps and warranties, um, and, and this was a, a year later. Um, so what happened then was that the, the buyer realized that it, that it had some uh, attorney-client communications on its computer system that it had acquired as part of the deal, and uh, to, to the buyer's credit, frankly, it, it addressed the issues proactively by filing for a, a, basically notifying the party that it, the, the, I'm sorry, notifying Mr. Tang that it had these communications, and then filing a motion to clarify the privilege issues. The the New York Court of Appeals took what I would describe as the common sense approach, which is uh, to basically say, look. Uh, there are two buckets of attorney client communications that we're going to we're going to deal with 
the stuff that deals with tech, Techniplex before the deal, just historical stuff, stuff dealing with their employees, stuff dealing with um, compliance with laws, you know, maybe prior litigation they had, that all is attorney-client privilege communications. Um, but but the 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 privilege passed to the to to the new Techniplex. So there's no issue there. So the new Techniplex, as part of the merger deal, acquired essentially the right to those privileges. However, we're gonna we're gonna look at the at the attorney-client communications with respect to the merger negotiations differently, and we're gonna say essentially that the new Techniplex did not succeed to the old Techniplex's right to control the attorney-client privilege. Now, remember, I said that the merger agreement had as parties both Mr. Tang, the sole shareholder, but also old Techniplex, and basically, they said that the the counsel who represented the old Techniplex. Uh, that those those attorney-client communications did not pass to uh, new Techniplex, and if you read the decision, it is purely policy-based. There isn't really an effort to say this. You know, we're looking at a particular statute. We're looking at any. They're just saying, sort of from a common sense perspective, and also from a policy perspective, it would be silly to say that the selling the selling parties' attorney-client privileges passed to the buying entity as part of the deal. Um, then, and this is a significant point, subsequent to this decision, and as I mentioned, this used to be the leading decision on this issue, the Delaware Court of Chancery uh, basically cited this decision with approval in a case called Posta Revo v. AG Paintball Holdings, Inc. Um, however, in that case, it, although it was a Delaware court, the court did not apply Delaware law, and it certainly did not cite uh, Section 259 of the Delaware General Corporation Law, which is the statute that deals with the effect of a merger. And as you'll see, that was significant. Okay, so then uh, just uh, a year ago, uh, the Delaware Court of Chancery decided the Great Hill Equity Partners versus SIG Growth Equity Fund case. In this case, uh, Great Hill Equity Partners is a private equity fund, and it acquired a payments processing firm called Plymus Inc. And uh, it was structured as a reverse triangular merger. If you don't know what that is, I won't bore you, but basically what it means is that it, the, the deal was structured as a merger where uh, Plymus Inc. was the surviving entity, but it became a subsidiary of an acquisition vehicle of Great Hill Equity Partners. Um, one year after closing, the buyer sued Plymouth's former stockholders, alleging fraud in connection with the reps and warranties about the business. Um, as was the case uh, in uh, the Techniplex uh, decision, the buyer had taken possession of the target's com computer system, which contained merger-related communications uh, between the stockholders and the sell-side deal council. The buyer maintained that since it had acquired Plymouth, it also had acquired control of Plymouth's attorney-client privilege. Okay, so the court's reasoning, as I mentioned, the court relied very heavily on uh, Section 259 of the Delaware General Corporation Law, which provides, and the language is significant, all property rights, privileges, powers and franchises, and all and every other interest of the constituent corporations shall be thereafter as effectually the property of the surviving or resulting corporation. So the chancellor held that this language was unambiguous and that it uh, unambiguously included the constituent corporation's attorney-client privilege. Um, the seller argued, the selling stockholders argued, that the statutory term privilege only includes certain property rights but does not extend to privileges established by rules of evidence. Um, the court rejected that in what was frankly a fairly terse opinion and just said uh, that we find nothing in either the language or the legislative history or even in treatises that we found on the topic to uh, to support that reading. Um, the chancellor also uh, specifically said that, um, they, the, the chancellor, let me take a step back, the chancellor acknowledged that the, the policy result was potentially not one that the parties anticipated, but it said that that the, the chancellor said that the court's job was not to make policy decisions in the end, that this was an issue that was unambiguous on its face based on the statute. 
However, and this is the uh, this is a significant point, that the chancellor did also indicate, and I've quoted it because it's important language that the parties could have negotiated special contractual arrangements to protect themselves and prevent certain aspects of the privilege from transferring to the surviving corporation in the merger. Okay, so in light of the Great Hill case, um, what, what do we need to do? Um, the first thing to consider is uh, which state law will govern um, and whether that state has a statute that could statute that could create uh, this type of an issue. Um, I mentioned I, I know a number of people uh, listening to this webinar are, are Missouri attorneys, and the, Missouri has a very similar statute. It says such surviving or new corporation shall thereupon and thereafter possess all the rights, privileges, immunities, and franchises of the merging or consolidating corporation. So. Although I'm not aware of a Missouri court uh, issuing an opinion on this exact topic, certainly the potential is there given the Great Hill case. Um, so if you represent essentially the selling party in a merger, you need to be very cognizant of the need to clearly delineate privilege ownership issues. Um, and frankly, as long as you anticipate this, it seems to me that you, you should be able to protect yourself at least somewhat contractually. It's It's hard for me to see how the buyer could argue that it, at least if the issue is raised and you're trying to address it contractually that the buyer should be uh, entitled to obtain ownership of the seller's merger related attorney client uh, communications. So again, um, the Delaware Chancellor's opinion in the Great Hill case was based on what was viewed as unambiguous statutory language, not on a policy rationale. Okay, so just a few things to consider. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of times who our actual client is uh, in a, a you know sort of a metaphysical sense can change over time with the deal if the deal structure changes. So uh, if you're in a situation where maybe you've historically represented the corporation but it turns into a stock sale, you may want to clearly make make it apparent in your engagement letter that, that in that stock sale you're representing the, the selling shareholders. Um, and uh, you know, it may be a, sometimes deals are structured with both the target entity and the selling shareholders as parties, and so you want to broadly define who is seller. Um, also, you need to be aware that inadvertent, and this is just a separate doctrine, but inadvertent disclosure of privileged communications can constitute a waiver. That uh, is not that does not occur lightly, typically, if you look at the case law, but it is a possibility. Um, so. And I, I realize that this is a lot to read. I won't go through it in detail. Um, but this is a sample provision that actually comes with some tweaks from a deal that I worked on. Um, and as you'll see, um, we're trying to basically get the Techniplex result, which is to uh, distinguish the, the pre-closing pre closing privilege communications um, and put them into two buckets, the stuff that's related to the deal and the stuff that's not related to the deal, um, and, and treat them differently. It's also a good idea to include some language uh, making clear that uh, an inadvertent um, waiver doesn't occur because you may have left some information on a computer system or things like that. Um, and also, I didn't discuss this in detail before, but one aspect, even in the Techniplex case, the court did find, although it, it separated the two types of pr privileged communications into two buckets, it did find that the former selling shareholders' counsel was conflicted out because of their role with respect to the stuff that did pass to the, the surviving entity in the merger because they had been the, the target's historical counsel. So another issue to deal with is conflict issues uh, aside from the attorney-client privileges. So. Just, I'll, I'll just conclude by providing a couple of just practical takeaways. Um, and by the way, I understand that this, I realize again, this is a lot to read on this slide. Um, I do understand that uh, the, the, a copy of our slides have gone to each of the webinar participants, so you should have it if you want to access this later. Uh, or if you don't have it, uh, just send us a message and we'll make sure you get it. Um, but the first takeaway is that you should determine under what state law the agreement is governed and whether there's a statute that's going to give rise to potential issues. Uh, as I mentioned, obviously Delaware creates issues um, and Missouri at least has the potential to. Um, second, you should give some thought as to what types of privileged communications are particularly sensitive. 
so that you can describe them with um, particularity. Third, uh, you should take permissible proactive steps to indicate that certain communications are privileged. Um, to the extent you can, I know it's difficult in the modern age with IT systems, but remove or segregate privileged communications from the target's computers. Um, ensure that physical documents are segregated. And, and most importantly, especially given that the first two may not be that easy to accomplish completely, clearly inform the buyer of the intent to that to basically withhold certain communications on the grounds of privilege, which will lessen the possibility that you'll have an, an, something deemed to be an inadvertent waiver. Um, and then, uh, as this provision indicates, I think it's very important to reflect your intentions contractually. Even in the Great Hill case, the court did um, indicate that the parties could have drafted around the result if they had anticipated it. And so that's something to keep in mind. Now, I will say, all that being said, I'm not aware of any cases interpreting this type of language in the wake of Great Hill. So I think there is still a lot of uncertainty about how these issues would be resolved in litigation. But certainly, if you represent the seller, you should do your best to, to deal with them proactively if you can. So uh, with that, um, I, we're done with our formal presentation. And um, just ask if uh, anyone has any questions for either Kim or me. OK, it looks like we have one question uh, for me on uh, successor liability and asset transactions. Uh, this uh, question was whether I could give an example of some cases where successor liability was not found. Um, yes, I can. Uh, there is one, um, there's one case in particular that a recent uh, Ninth Circuit case from 2010 called Sullivan versus uh, Dollar Tree Stores. And in that circumstance, um, there was an employee, um, she was employed by um, a company called Factory U2. It was another type of dollar store. She had applied for benefits under the Federal Medical Leave Act. Actually, she did that after the acquisition. Dollar Tree purchased um, uh, some of the business of Factory U2. So she, after the transaction, she actually applied for uh, FMLA benefits and was denied some of those benefits. Uh, she sued Dollar Tree, saying that they were a successor employer. And the court there actually found that Dollar Tree was not uh, a a successor, um, and there was not successor liability in this transaction and some of the factors that they looked at. Um, they did note that Dollar Tree was operating a similar dollar store business in the same location, but they other factors that sort of weighed against successor liability, they said that Dollar Tree uh, did not purchase any other assets from the old buyer other than a lease of the building location. Uh, Dollar Tree spent uh, several weeks renovating the store's interior uh, to meet the Dollar Tree design specifications, the look and the feel. Um, they also noted that uh, the old, the old uh, buyer, or the, sorry, the old seller's employees had to reapply for jobs at Dollar Tree, and Dollar Tree actually only hired a couple of employees, only the particular plaintiff and one other employee. So in those circumstances, the court um, found that the factors weighed against successor liability. That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I, I also have one uh, question that's come in on uh, my earnout uh, presentation, and that has to deal with um, liquidated damages provisions and how they should be drafted. Um, just to refresh everybody's memory, I mentioned that one challenge in earnout provisions is. Uh, is how how you calculate damages because courts have difficulty if if the buyer breaches covenants with respect to the post closing operation of the business the 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 court may have difficulty figuring out what what damages to award the seller in other words how do you put the seller in the place that they would have been in had the buyer not breached because it can be difficult to know uh what would have happened so the 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 way to proactively address that is to include a liquidated damages clause as most of you know, liquidated damage clauses have kind of two prongs that it's good to set forth explicitly, which is A, that uh, the damages are for some reason difficult to calculate, which clearly in this case they are, but second, that whatever you determine to be the liquidated damages is a reasonable estimate. I've always thought that there's a certain tension in those two prongs, but, but those are the, the two prongs, and it's a good idea to recite them 
completely, and then uh, obviously uh, to make some effort to determine uh, how you calculate damages in, in a way that is fair, but in a way that is clearly set out so that the uh, the court doesn't have to, to guess. Uh, and certainly if you represent the seller, that puts you in a position where you've got a lot more certainty going in. So um, anyway, so that, that was a good question as well. Uh, so right now we're not seeing any other questions. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you ha have any um, if you have any uh, any questions that occur to you uh, subsequent to uh, signing off, feel free to contact um, feel free to contact Kim and me. Um, our contact information is on the slide that's on the screen now. So. Uh, we would love to talk to you, um, but we very much enjoy the uh, opportunity enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you today. So thank you very much.